I'm excited about the narrative facility of the documentary format. It's easier to tell a complex story when you can just cut to people explaining things to the camera. Hi guys, welcome to Thread Reviews. I'm Elliot and my critique partner today is Imogen. We're going to be looking at documentary and asking the question, what is the purpose of a documentary? We're going to be doing this through the medium of two recent documentaries that came out in the last year, both about the agriculture industry. See? Fish in a barrel. Sometimes you have to lie. One often has to distort a thing to capture its true spirit. This is a quote by famous American filmmaker Robert Flaherty, who produced the first commercially successful feature-length documentary, The Nuke of the North, in 1922. Though very popular at the time, Flaherty was criticised for his portrayal of the Inuit people, choosing to present a more historical image of them that isolated their culture from the modern world. For example, he requested the main character use a traditional spear while hunting, even though the Inuit people had had access to guns for quite a long time. Despite the criticism, the documentary was regarded as a classic and was one of the first 25 films selected by the Library of Congress to be preserved in the National Film Registry for being culturally historically or aesthetically significant. So since the beginning it seems there's always been this balancing act between storytelling and fact. You have this even more today with the rise of reality TV and true crime serials like Tiger King. It all begs the question, how truthful does a documentary really have to be, if indeed that is even its true purpose? For this video we're going to look at two documentaries that both focus on agriculture but through polarized lenses. Animal. Not just any farm. We're talking like something out of a children's book. It's amazing how many of the books that we read in earliest childhood have the same theme. It's all about a farm. But it's not really a farm that bears much relationship to the farms I see these days. The first is 2018's The Biggest Little Farm, which was directed by John Chester and is the story of how he and his wife Molly buy and build a farm. The film was reviewed well by critics and won several awards, including the Grand Teton Award and the Best People and Nature Film at the Jackson Wilde Awards, which we at Thread have been assured are basically the Oscars for social change. The second is Apocalypse Cow, How Meat Killed the Planet, which premiered on the UK's Channel 4 at the start of 2020 and was written and presented by George Mombo. Taking the stance that farming is in fact the number one cause of the current climate crisis, the doc looks into the advantages of fake meat and how it could be the future of how we feed ourselves. It hasn't won any awards, but it did manage to piss off quite a few farmers and unionists. Well, I'm a food industry. I'm very important for you. I'm important for you three times a day to well, make sure that you survive. Except I don't eat any of your products. Shame on you. Apocalypse Cow uses a tried and tested documentary format we've seen a thousand times before, whilst Biggest Little Farm is different in that it's quite innovative. It's an aesthetic piece that's also intensely personal and shot by its subjects. But whilst Apocalypse Cow is quite literally a revolutionary war cry, calling on viewers to take up arms against an industry that's laying waste to our lands and decimating our natural ecosystems, Biggest Little Farm doesn't seem to have any clear message at all. Which begs the question, which do we prefer? The artistic revolution or the social one? And which is more important for the documentary format? To describe The Biggest Little Farm, I'm going to use the term Disney documentary. From the characterization of the animals, right down to the font that they use for the title cards. Just look at the poster of the film and tell me that it doesn't look like a sequel to Babe. This isn't a criticism of the film. The documentary fully embraces the aesthetic choice. There's even an animated scene where Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck would look right at home. From a cinematography standpoint, the film is beautifully shot. There are so many gorgeous scenes and images that have Mother Nature looking like Mrs. Robinson. Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Aren't you? 
of course, it helps that fifty percent of the farming couple is made up of an Emmy award-winning filmmaker and television director. Somehow, this film even manages to make maggots in dung look good. But it's not only the visual side of things that leads to this impression. The storytelling element is equally Disney. John Chester's soft-spoken storytime narration, complemented by the country banjo twanging xylophone chiming soundtrack, not to mention the fact that the majority of the main characters are animals, and they are really used as narrative devices throughout the film. They're the ones who are motivating the action and inspiring the solutions to the obstacles that they have to overcome while running the farm. The documentary even chalks up the couple's decision to buy a farm, down to their desire to keep their beautifully blue-eyed dog, Todd. The Biggest Little Farm uses many dramatic techniques and editing tricks that you'd find in fictional filmmaking. Whether it's to create a sense of horror, or if it's to draw a parallel between the hero and villain. There's a great example of metaphorical editing when John and Molly discover that their mentor, Alan, has died halfway through the project. And this section is intercut with the death of a sheep and shots of its orphaned lamb trying to survive without its provider. The metaphor would be blatantly obvious if it weren't for the veil of tears in your eyes at watching a little lamb roaming around, following other sheep and being turned away. It's very, very Disney. The documentary even starts in media's res to hook the audience in right from the get-go with a Californian wildfire on the doorstep of Apricot Farms. This is very good filmmaking, but does it make a good documentary? Interestingly enough, Apocalypse Cow also starts in media's res, but with environmentalist and vegan George Monboyo about to shoot a deer. Similarly Disney. The deer are just down in the hollow. Bambi, quick, the thicket! But Apocalypse Cow is anything but a Disney documentary thematically. The children's story aesthetic has grown up and been replaced with cartoonish comic book style of art with a bold three colour palette that is kind of reminiscent of fascist propaganda. The overall look of the film is by no means ugly but when compared to The Biggest Little Farm it's impossible not to see Apocalypse Cow as overcast gritty and grounded in reality. Even the soundtrack is more dramatic. The whimsical banjo is replaced with a haunting acoustic guitar beat that marches relentlessly on just like Monboyo's message. If Apocalypse Cow is what you'd call a hard-hitting documentary, then The Biggest Little Farm is a pillow. The message is front and centre at the very start of the film. Farming is killing our planet. And if you didn't know that was what it was going to be about, it's even in the title. Monboyo dives right into the global implications of industrial farming from the out. His documentary is half as long as John Chester's farm biography, but in it he visits multiple countries, talks to professionals from across the spectrum of the agriculture industry, and tries to discuss one of our generation's greatest moral dilemma, that being the argument between ethical farming and environmental farming. He shows us that ethically produced organic farming, where animals are allowed to roam and graze and live happy lives and aren't kept in cramped slaughterhouses, is actually environmentally unsustainable to an absurd degree. He really tells us about the industry he's interrogating, about the global food chain from the Amazon to the feed of the crops to the cow to us. He gives us facts, figures, arguments that make sense and he even proposes a solution to the problems he unearths in the form of stem cell meat and electricity grown grain crops. His documentary faces outwards. Biggest Little Farm, however, barely peaks above the fence it constructs around its bucolic idyll. It's this bucolic idyll which we all grow up with and we all come to believe as children that this is what farming really is. And it takes quite a lot to unsee that, to recognise that actually something rather different is going on in the countryside. 
At no point did John and Molly try to apply their vision for living in harmony with nature to the world writ large in any kind of way. Their farm is maybe a success ecologically, as they try very hard to prove, but commercially it's surely completely untenable, and they never fully explain their funding beyond a vague reference to an initial seed investor. Pun intended. <laughs> The self-regulating biosphere that John and Molly are trying to create at Apricot Lane Farms is a good metaphor for the insularity of the film itself. This is a documentary about agriculture that barely even mentions the agricultural industry. It's about these 200 acres in California only, and we rarely stray from that territory. Completely the other end of the spectrum, however, Monboyo's concepts are so macro in Apocalypse Cow that he needs a literal scale model of the UK to represent them. All art is a kind of exploring. To discover and reveal is the way every artist sets about his business. So maybe the way to judge a documentary is by looking at how successfully it translates the intent of the filmmaker to the audience. After all, art shouldn't be all things to all people. Why can't The Biggest Little Farm just be a self-contained story and an aesthetic experience? But a revealing interview with the LA Times conducted with John Chester after the documentary debuted shows that he did in fact intend the film to tap into a prevailing narrative about climate change. He's asked directly by the interviewer whether the intent in making the film was to tell a story or inspire others to do what he did. And he responds, the intent was to inspire people. But inspire them to do what? The Biggest Little Farm briefly touches on the perils of big agriculture by a disparaging reference to the industrial chicken mill that used to operate in the adjacent land to them. John and Molly situate themselves apart from that farm very deliberately and industrial farming of any kind. They say they want to bring back the old style of farming. And we do all of this in perfect harmony with nature, like a traditional farm from the past. It's a farm with one pig and one sheep and one cow one horse and one dog and one chicken and they're all living together in perfect harmony. But what they don't do is address the reason why farming abandoned the old style and industrialised in the first place. Farming did this because the world's insatiable demand for animal products means that if we farmed all our food like John and Molly do, instead of packing animals together like sardines, we would need around 10.5 Earths to sustain us. And also because farming like John and Molly do simply isn't profitable. Again, they at no point mention how they're sustaining their massive agricultural project as well as feeding themselves and the sizeable staff that you see at many points throughout the documentary beyond the first six months of production. From all the context the film gives, you're expected to believe that they've made all this money through selling eggs. Some other questions the documentary raises are whether or not they themselves live entirely off their land, as was their stated aim at the beginning of the film. Her dream was literally to grow everything she could possibly cook with. But we're given no insight as to whether her dream of going from her own farm to her own table is ever fully realised. And if it's not, there are pretty dire implications, because they're in fact tapping into the vast wealth of agricultural produce not created in their Eden, but made in industrial farms each time they eat. And so they're clearly not as self-sustaining as the documentary would want you to believe. In fact, at one point they even imply that they're selling some of their pigs directly to these industrial farms to head to the slaughter, but it's not made clear because at this point, the narration that's followed you throughout the film suddenly goes quiet. It seems that if the concept of death can't be poignantly manipulated by the filmmakers to garner sympathy for Apricot Lane Farm's project, then it's simply not mentioned at all. There's no discussion about why the animals might be on the farm or what's gonna happen to the animals that are on the farm. The more you ask these questions as a viewer, the more you realise why John never actually gives you any space to ruminate on them, instead distracting you with beautiful close-ups of larvae hatching and rabbits gallivanting and such. Because if you were to ask these questions, then the fabric of the very film would fall apart. Something else the film never brings up, interestingly, is climate change. This documentary starts with the California wildfires of 2018 bearing down on Apricot Lane Farms like a big ellipsis, an invitation to talk about the exact ecological disasters and extreme weather events caused by the agricultural industry they're apparently trying to revolutionise. And guys, the wildfires happened so, so nothing, apparently. The second the wildfires invite us to think global, to think about the impact of agriculture as an industry, is the minute the film shuts back down again and takes us straight back into the living room of John and Molly. Biggest Little Farm is shot with some big, big framing, but with some very little ideas. 
In his interview with the LA Times, Chester goes on to say, We face the climate issue and environmental farming as a polarising thing. But this incredibly deep connection that he's found with the land wasn't polarising, and actually made him fall in love with something and so deeply into it that it somehow made him feel safer about everything. And that, I think, is the crux of the issue with this documentary for me, because I don't think that John's intent was to inspire people to create their own biodiverse, self-sustaining farms at all. What he really wants to do is to make people feel safe. And that's exactly what Apocalypse Cow doesn't do. It makes you aware of your own place in a production line that we all engage in, and that's uncomfortable for a lot of people. It inspires the exact sense of guilt that John was trying to avoid. Apocalypse Cow is meant to jolt you, to disturb you, and to reveal an ugly but true reality. It's meant to make you think. In doing that, it guaranteed for itself two things. Number one, that it would be revolutionary. And number two, that it would never reach the level of popularity that Biggest Little Farm did. Because guess what? People prefer feeling safe to facing harsh realities. One of the most well-known documentary filmmakers, Michael Moore, would probably be mad at me for even including the word documentary in that description of him. In his mind, he is just a filmmaker who wants his art to inspire people. So let's say that's the purpose of documentary. In that sense, Apocalypse Cow definitely inspired me more to look at my eating habits and think about the consequences of them far more than The Biggest Little Farm did. And yet, The Biggest Little Farm was more popular, won more awards, and was more acclaimed. John Grierson said, In documentary, we deal with the actual, and in one sense, the real. But the really real, if I may use that phrase, is sometimes deeper than that. The only reality which counts in the end is the interpretation which is profound. I think what he's trying to say here then is that the purpose of documentary should be down to the viewer. To be entertained, to be informed, to be inspired. Documentary is often considered a subcategory within film, like comedy or thriller, and is therefore the terms of what it should be feel a little more boxed in, and it's probably more helpful to look at it as another side to the same coin, equal in size and potential for creativity. Just because it's non-fiction doesn't make it any less art and therefore it can, and maybe should, be open to interpretation. So having looked at these two films, Imogen, what, what are your sort of closing thoughts on them? It's interesting that you say that being non-fiction doesn't make these two films any less art, and I think if we're gonna run with that interpretation, then we've got to think a little bit harder about what the purpose of art should be in general, not just the purpose of documentaries. For me, I do think that artists and filmmakers should be able to create a self-contained product, but these two filmmakers made the choice to engage in a discourse that obviously has so much context around it at the moment. And I think in some ways, The Biggest Little Farm really missed a lot of the opportunities it was given to talk about these issues in a more wide ranging context. But then again, maybe the fact that it didn't is the reason why it's successful. That's a good point. Chicken or the egg? Mm. <laughs> well, I think seeing as we've quoted so many famous and influential artists in this video, we should end with another one. Art shouldn't be a mirror held up to reality, but should be a hammer with which to shape it. If, if you'll ask me, I think I agree with Brett. I think I preferred Apocalypse Cow because it speaks to a lot of values I really hold dear, and I think it's doing something brave. It's trying to be revolutionary, and I think that should be respected. Thank you everyone for watching. This was more of a more of a sort of video essay style of review, but let us know if you liked that. Um, we do more. Because we, so many we would more. love to do more. We can do hundreds and thousands. We can... we can... Maybe, like... We can. We can. But give, we me, can. give me time. <laughs> give it enough time. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and head over to our website, thread.com, because it's great. And we've got night mode now. Night mode! Which looks great. Uh, and if any of you have seen either of these two documentaries, please do let us know what you think. If you disagree with us, if you agree with us, if what we've said maddens you to your very core and you have fallen into hysterics due to it and you would like to express your outrage, please feel free in the comments. Bye guys! Bye Thanks everyone! For watching. Bye. Two, three. It's impossible not to see Apocalypse. Uh, but Apocalypse. Uh, but Apocalypse. Ah! Shit! <laughs> I ruined it! But Apocalypse. A cockalypse pow! <laughs> and an aesthetic. And an aesthetic. Fuck! <laughs>